Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. An update on markets, then we're joined by a macroeconomist that helps you make the complex simple. Is an economic depression possible? And what's going to win out, monetary inflation or deflation, today on Get Rich Education? Fortunately for you, Congress has made it possible to get up to $200,000 out of your current 401k or TSP to invest in real estate or your own business, and that's even if you're still working. The thing is, you can get all this money tax-free. The EQRP is your secret weapon. With the CARES Act expiring soon, the EQRP company helps you unleash your retirement funds now. Learn more and text message QRP in all capital letters to 72000. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Another week where you are back doing the right thing before you do things right. Now, I don't think I'm too much of an I told you so type of guy, but for a long time, I've told you that there will not be a V-shaped economic recovery. And for a long time, I've outlined those parts of America where the rent amounts are most resilient. And I really only have real estate provider guests on the show that tend to represent those more resilient markets. Well, we're going to discuss what's happening with rental amounts nationally in a bit. But first, every quarter or two, I whip around the major asset classes here with some numbers. So let's bring you up to date. Since we recently closed out the first half of the year, national real estate prices were up 5%. Now that's from May of last year to May of this year, the latest figures that there are. Now, most of the rest of this is for the first half of the year. Most market watchers, they view the S&P 500 as the broadest and therefore the most worthwhile stock market indicator. You may not have known that it comprises about 80% of the available market cap of U.S. stocks, and the S&P 500 was down 5.5% the first half of this year, and that was largely a tale of two quarters, down in quarter one, then up in quarter two. Now that right there, that produced a V-shaped pattern, but the stock market is not the economy. The economy is jobs and productivity. The NASDAQ was actually up during this period. The NASDAQ is a tech-heavy index, and people turned to technology more in the pandemic. The infamous FAMGA group, that's Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Google, and Amazon, those tech giants account for 40% of the NASDAQ, but only the AM part of that, Apple and Microsoft, appear in the Dow. Gold glittered and shined its way up 17% in the first half of this year. Oil was down 36%. And yeah, it was late April when it fell to that fantastic, almost incomprehensible negative $37 a barrel. The current rate of consumer inflation is zero. Yeah, it's zero, at least on the government-reported CPI basis. That is a year-over-year number. That number had to absorb in the fact that energy and even auto insurance prices declined. That's something that affects consumers and your renters. The current unemployment rate is 11%. And the Fed just recently predicted where they think that the unemployment rate will be by the end of the year. Do you have any idea where they think it will be? The Fed expects the unemployment rate to drop from 11% down to 9%. I'm just rounding to the nearest whole number. You know what's interesting? You know what the Fed does when it tries all these things to maneuver and position the economy and it empties its toolkit? You know what happens next? It just goes and finds another toolkit. So the Fed slashed interest rates back in March essentially to zero. And because they couldn't cut them any further, what they've since said to help instill confidence is that they would hold rates at zero through 2022. That's finding another toolkit. 
If they won't drop them any further, then next they'll promise not to raise them for a while. Countries around the globe performed the first coordinated global shutdown of the economy ever. That's what happened in the first half of this year, ever. And yeah, we are in the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s, even though it's expected to be shorter lived. That is our asset class whip around. Housing Wire recently told us where rents are up and where rents are down in the pandemic. And look, yes, I guess this is more along the lines of I told you so type of stuff. In inland markets of the Midwest and South, they cash flow. They're slower moving appreciation wise, but they do hold up best in a recession. Well, Housing Wire tells us that the bigger gains came from Memphis, Tennessee, St. Louis, Missouri, Greensboro, North Carolina, Jacksonville, Florida, Columbus, Ohio, Tampa, Florida, Cleveland, Kansas City, and Virginia Beach, Virginia. That's where the bigger gains in rents came from. Meanwhile, some generally popular markets recorded only these flat to modest gains in new lease pricing. Okay, so they're doing all right, but they're sort of in this next tier down. We're talking about Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas, Charlotte, Phoenix, Houston, Denver, and Las Vegas. And then the next tier down, new lease pricing fell 3 to 5% in a few key markets. So actually a mild rent drop in Atlanta, Washington, D.C., San Antonio, and Austin, Texas, Philadelphia, and Miami. However, executed rents dropped by double digits in, and gosh, these are exactly the type of places I've discussed avoiding from day one. So this bottom tier, yes, these are the places where I've been dishing out more warnings than Fauci. Yes, I've dished out more warnings than Dr. Anthony Fauci about investing in places like these big losers, Boston, New York, Los Angeles, and San Jose and Oakland, California. Rent for a one-bedroom apartment in San Francisco, in fact, plunged nearly 12% year over year in June. That's according to apartment rental platform Zumper. That's a record decline for the city. And that is the largest drop of any market in the country. So big picture, what's happening in San Francisco is happening in a lot of the larger, especially coastal cities across the U.S. Now, there's always opportunity anywhere. But if you want resilience in cash flow, then stay in what I call the stable markets and not the volatile coastal markets. And Zumper is also recognizing what it calls the Brooklyn effect. That is when people move from expensive cities to less expensive cities nearby. And that Brooklyn effect could probably use a name change at this point because people have been moving out of Manhattan to lower priced Brooklyn for so long that now much of Brooklyn has become higher priced. But anyway, prices in two of those cheaper Brooklyn effect cities, Sacramento, California and Providence, Rhode Island, they rose about 5% last month while the majority of the most expensive markets trended down, but the effect is most pronounced in the tech hub of San Francisco, where companies are more likely to implement these not just work from home, but work from anywhere policies, and companies have shed jobs as the pandemic crushed their business. Sometimes you've got to go macro and get a big picture look to decide how to position your portfolio. Now, you can make smaller tactical moves in your real estate portfolio, like for example, adding carports to increase the rent amount that you can get, all the way up to larger strategic moves based on the overall direction of the economy. We're talking about those macro strategic adjustments that you need to make today with macroeconomist Richard Duncan. Since I first had Richard on the show nearly six years ago now, macroeconomics is probably one area where I have done more learning. Myself, for example, six years ago, I had never even thought about the difference between consumer price inflation, which I just told you is now zero, versus asset price inflation, which is something that could still be taking place right now. I'll be sure to bring up that topic and more today. 
This week's feature guest is a classically trained economist by way of Vanderbilt and Babson. He's worked with both the World Bank and the IMF. But you know, the great thing is, despite that lofty experience, he's not off in some inaccessible ivory tower or investment bank. He makes himself accessible to you. He's the author of three books on the global economic crises, including the international bestseller called The Dollar Crisis, and it forecasts the global economic calamity of 2008 with great accuracy. Today, he's an American living in Thailand, and one way that he makes himself available to everyday people like you is his bi-weekly publication of the video newsletter MacroWatch, which can be found on his website at richardduncaneconomics.com. A little Get Rich Education history here. The first ever six episodes of Get Rich Education back in 2014 were all monologues by me. Today's guest is also the first ever guest in Get Rich Education history when he was here with us back in episode seven, and he's been with you here about annually since that time. So welcome back to Get Rich Education, the mastermind behind RichardDuncanEconomics.com and the creative genius of the MacroWatch video newsletter. It is Richard Duncan. Keith, thank you very much. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Well, so much has happened since you were here with us last year. That's when we were still in the longest economic expansion in American history. And today it's a pandemic induced recession. So where would you either like to begin, Richard? Well, it is a very different world than it was when we last spoke at the end of October last year. As you mentioned, I live in Asia. I live in Thailand. And so I think a logical place to begin was that I've had a lot of advantages, I think, in my career as a result of living in Asia. Not only was Asia booming economically for so long, I first moved out to Hong Kong in 1986, and we had a couple of decades of really strong economic growth. Yeah. But also, there are a lot of things that have happened in Asia that then happened to the rest of the world. For instance, the Asia crisis in 1997, we had a big stock market bubble that popped, and I learned an enormous amount from watching Thailand blow into an economic bubble. And what I learned there was very applicable to what happened again and again later in the rest of the world when the rest of the world blew into various economic bubbles that then imploded. That's what ultimately led me to write the dollar crisis in 2003 and enabled me to foresee that economic crisis that ultimately blew up in 2007, 2008. Another thing that I've witnessed in Asia that has benefited my experience in forecasting is that Asia went through SARS uh, back in 2003. Right. And SARS was quite terrifying. I was living in Hong Kong at the time. And of course, in retrospect, it looked very mild in comparison with the coronavirus. But SARS taught Asia a number of important lessons about how to deal with pandemics. And then the coronavirus, of course, erupted here in China first, and then started spreading around Asia and only then moved on to Italy and Iran and later to the U.S. Unfortunately, it looked pretty certain that coronavirus was going to hit the U.S. hard before Americans were aware that that was going to happen. And so I started writing macro watch videos on the topic of the coronavirus. The first one was on March 1st, thoughts on the coronavirus. And the second one was March 15th. It was called recession or depression. And at that point, people weren't talking about this becoming an economic depression at that point. But this has been a long lead up to answering your question. What I'd like to begin by saying is what I have been saying since early March, whether or not this turns into a protracted 1930s style Great Depression, or whether we recover relatively quickly, is all going to depend on whether or not the US government spends enough to keep the economy from collapsing, and whether or not the Fed creates enough money to make all of that government spending affordable. In other words, if the Fed finances the government debt, then interest rates won't go higher. Now, back in early March, it wasn't at all certain that the government was going to respond quickly enough to prevent utter disaster, but they actually did. Not long after that, the government passed a number of economic rescue bills, now amounting to nearly $3 trillion. And the Fed has created roughly $3 $3 trillion this year so far. And that has enabled people to continue paying their rent for the most part and their mortgages and their car loans and their credit card loans. And that has kept people, medium and small businesses from failing by the hundreds of thousands. 
and has prevented large corporations from failing, which means it's prevented the entire US banking system from collapsing. Had the government not done what it has done through these rescue bills, then by this point, all of the US banks would have failed without some sort of extraordinary other kind of government intervention to prop them up. Because when you have so many people unemployed, if they didn't have any income from the government, they would be defaulting on all their loans on such a large scale that the banking system couldn't have survived. So that's why things haven't totally collapsed entirely in the United States and around the world. And going forward, we're going to need more of the same. How much more is not yet certain, but probably a great deal more. Much of the rescue money is going to run out at the end of July. And so hopefully the government will come through with another very large rescue bill sometime in the next few weeks before that occurs. And the Fed is going to have to keep creating a tremendous amount of money so that all of the government borrowing that will be necessary doesn't push up interest rates and damage the economy through much higher interest rates. So hopefully the government will continue to borrow and spend all that's necessary and the Fed will continue to create as much money as necessary to finance that at low interest rates. We've launched the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program. We've gone ahead and facilitated keeping the economy stable, oftentimes with unemployment compensation for workers that's even greater than what they were receiving when they were working. So we're paving over America with dollars, but we're not really producing anything of value with these dollars that we're using to pave over America, but we are upholding things. We continue to patch these holes in the raft as they appear and open up. Are we approaching it the right way with the Fed's tools? Now, of course, the Fed's tools can't make the coronavirus go away. That's a medical problem. But is this the most sound way to approach it? I mean, maybe we'll have a day of reckoning down the road, but in the same vein, bending is better than breaking. Absolutely. I, I don't see any other way that they could approach it better. I mean, there are many ways they could approach it worse if they stuck to the orthodoxy preached by the Austrian economist school of thought, for instance, the Fed wouldn't do anything. And then we would now be in a great depression that would be everlasting. So that would certainly be the wrong way of going about things. But the right way is what they've been doing. In one respect, this is very much like what occurred during World War II. During World War II, the government had to spend enormous amounts of money to fight the war. Government debt increased five times between 1941 and 1945. And the Fed's holdings of government debt increased 11 times during those four years. Now, of course, it's different from World War II as well, in that World War II, there was full employment and full industrial capacity utilization. Everyone was working and the economy was booming because the government was spending and investing so much. This time is just the opposite. In this respect, it's more like the Great Depression, where the unemployment numbers are very high and capacity utilization is very low. So as you said, the money that's being spent is in a sense just filling the hole to prevent the economy from completely imploding and disintegrating. But that's money well spent because if we allow the economy to disintegrate, it's not going to put itself back together probably within our lifetime. Kicking the can down the road is better than dying. It means you're still alive. Absolutely. Uh, you know, they should have kicked the can down the road in 1930. Hundreds of millions of people around the world wished that they had over the next decade and a half. Part of what made the Great Depression such an awful calamity and a hardship for so many people and made it persist for 10 years is the fact that the Fed did not step in and be proactive like they are now. Well, of course, they were operating under a different set of rules back then, to be fair to the Fed. The Fed was required to have gold to back all the money that it created. And it took a long time before that requirement was gradually eliminated. The requirement was reduced during World War II. It was reduced again in 1965. And the requirement that the Fed hold gold to back the money it created was not entirely removed altogether until 1968. And then even after that, it took one more step for Nixon to announced that the United States would no longer allow other countries to exchange their dollars into U.S. gold in 1971, which caused a breakdown of the Bretton Woods system. 
But now we're no longer facing those constraints. The Fed is free to create absolutely as much money as it chooses, as are all the other central banks around the world today, because they have chosen to create so much money, both after the economic crisis of 2008 and during this crisis. That's why these two crises have not resulted in the global economy collapsing into a protracted Great Depression. I mean, we, we, it's too early to say what will happen with the coronavirus crisis, but we know that after the crisis of 2008, the Fed increased the amount of money that it created. In 2007, during the first 93 years of the Fed's existence, the Fed had only created $900 billion in total. By the end of 2014, it had created $4.5 trillion. So during those seven years, the amount of money the Fed created increased by five times. Gosh. And of course, the government debt soared by more than roughly $10 trillion during that period, seven years. And that's why we didn't collapse into a Great Depression that time. And if we do the same thing this time, even though the economy is in severe crisis at the moment, the forecasters are saying that in the second quarter, the U.S. economy on a year-on-year -year basis, if you take the contraction in the second quarter and annualize it, is expected to be down between 35% and 45% year on year. So it'd be a catastrophic second quarter. And it's going to be a bad year. The Fed is projecting that for the full year, the economy will contract by about 6%. So it's going to be rough. But if the government spends enough and the Fed creates enough money and finances it, then we're going to come out the other side of this crisis looking pretty much similar to the way our economy looked when we went in. Whereas if we were to adopt austerity, our civilization would probably collapse. The Fed does have tools to work with that they didn't in the Great Depression, just like you're talking about. Effectively, it is easier just to print dollars to an almost infinite scale since they don't need to be backed by gold. And like you mentioned, it was President Nixon that famously came on television that Sunday night, August 15th, 1971, and pretty much put the exclamation point on removing the dollar's tie to gold. This is something that happened well before I was born, but yet a lot of people still seem to think that the economy works that way and that you can't just print money out of thin air, but you effectively can. Jerome Powell recently came out and said so much in an international interview that they conjured dollars out of thin air. Well, just for an example, in one week, in March this year, the Fed created $586 billion in one week. Up until 2007, the Fed had only created $900 billion in total during the preceding 93 years. <laughs> so 900 in total compared with the creation of $586 billion in just one week. So yes, the Fed can create limitless amounts of money. Of course, the question is, will this lead to high rates of inflation. That's the only thing holding the central banks in check in terms of how much money they can create. That's right. That's just a staggering amount of money creation, even on an inflation-adjusted basis. I don't think I've heard the word trillion thrown around so much in one year as I have just this past year. We're going to come back and talk more about will this dollar creation create inflation and how you should position yourself you listen to Get Rich Education. Our guest is Richard Duncan. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Property investors can get killed with maintenance costs. That's less likely when you buy brand new construction. Let me tell you about JWB Real Estate Capital in bustling Jacksonville, Florida. They pioneered the build to rent model where you can invest in new construction, turnkey rental property. That's why JWB was featured on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. To learn more and see inventory, start now at newconstructionturnkey.com. The people that our listeners can't stop talking about are Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. They provided you with more loans than anyone. It's where I got my last few loans, and they finance single-family income property up to fourplexes. They're the number one lender for both beginners and veterans. Start your pre-qualification, chat with President Chaley Ridge personally, and you'll end up with your custom plan for expanding your cash flowing portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com. This is author Jim Rickards. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold and don't quit your daydream. 
Welcome back to Get Rich Education. We're talking with Richard Duncan. Check him out at richardduncaneconomics.com. That's where you'll find his popular and valuable and insightful video newsletter called MacroWatch. Richard, so all this money printing, or more accurately, currency printing, some think that that creates inflation every time more dollars are printed. They think it must create inflation, but not so fast, not necessarily. Just because there are more dollars that have been printed, even if they're chasing the same amount of goods and services, it doesn't necessarily mean that inflation has to occur at least right away. So tell us more about the prospects for high inflation with all this currency printing that's taken place to help pull us out of this pandemic-induced recession or depression. When people study economics or hear about economic theory secondhand, what they have generally been taught is economic theory from the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century, when the most important variable was the fact that money was backed by gold. So all of the economic theory was constructed on that premise that money is gold. And that created a superstructure of economic theory, economic orthodoxy, from which everything else in economics was derived. But that just simply is not the world in which we live anymore. So the economic orthodoxy that is still entrenched in everyone's mind is just no longer appropriate for the world in which we live now that gold no longer is money, now that money is no longer backed by gold and the Fed can create as much of it as they want. The second thing that has changed is really starting around 1980, globalization kicked in. Right. And we, we talked about this before. But up until under the Bretton Woods system, which ended in 1971, or, and under the gold standard before that, trade between nations had to balance. Because if you had a big trade deficit with another country, you had to pay for it with your gold. So if England had a big trade deficit with France 150 years ago, they would have had to pay for that deficit by putting their gold on a ship and sending it to France. Fork it over. And since gold was money, their money supply would contract and they'd go into a horrible recession and they would have very high unemployment and deflation. And the opposite would happen in France. They would have more gold, more money, so their economy would boom, full employment and inflation. And pretty soon, the French would start buying more cheap English goods, and the poor English would stop buying so many expensive French goods, and trade came back into balance. The point is, trade balanced. And up until 1971, it had to, under the Bretton Woods system. And it really more or less balanced for the next decade after that. But starting in the 1980s, the United States just began completely ignoring its trade deficit. It started running very large trade deficits for the first time ever. Under Reagan. And by, under Reagan and enormous budget deficits as well. And of course, the budget deficits are part of the reason we had trade deficits, the big budget deficits. The debt of the United States tripled under the Reagan administration. So even though Reagan is known for saying that government was the problem, he certainly used, used government debt to solve a lot of his problems and to make the U.S. economy boom. So by the mid-80s, the U.S. trade deficit was 3.5% of GDP, which was wildly beyond anything that had ever occurred before. And things just became worse and worse. China entered the global economy around 1990, and by 2006, the U.S. trade deficit was $800 billion a year. And so this completely changed everything. In the past, if the U.S. government had a big budget deficit, that tended to stimulate the U.S. economy, leading to full employment and higher demands for wages, and at the same time, full industrial capacity utilization, which put upward pressure on prices of manufactured goods, in combination leading to a wage push inflation spiral, and particularly if the Fed was involved in helping to finance the budget deficits. All of that in the past led to higher rates of inflation and ultimately led to the uh, high rates of inflation and the double-digit inflation in the 1970s. Now we have a global economy with nearly 8 billion people in the world, 2 billion of whom live on less than $3 a day. So suddenly it's like fish in a fishbowl that's been dropped into the ocean. The constraints that confined us in the past just no longer exist. We just need to swim out the top and realize we're in a vastly expanded economic environment with enormous pools of low-cost labor and vast excess industrial capacity all around the world that are allowing the U.S. government to spend trillions of dollars, deficits spend trillions of dollars, and the Fed to create trillions of dollars to finance those deficits 
without overheating the U.S. economy, without leading to high rates of U.S. inflation. In fact, at the moment, it's much more likely that we're going to have deflation over the next year than any kind of inflation. But that's because the coronavirus has created a deflationary demand shock since everyone has been locked down and un unable to spend. As long as globalization persists at all, certain that we are going to get significant rates of inflation. I don't know. We might. But again, going back to 2008, when the crisis hit, the Fed responded very quickly by creating vast amounts of money and pumping it into the financial sector. Even before quantitative easing started, they had this alphabet soup of lending programs that they were pumping credit into every corner of the economy. So during 2008 alone, the money supply in the U.S. increased by 150% just in that one year alone. That's astounding. And we didn't have inflation. There was deflation has been more of a problem, more of a worry over the last 12 years than inflation was. So, and again, as I mentioned before, by 2014, the Fed's total assets have increased by five times. And that didn't lead to inflation, significant inflation. At the consumer price level, it did lead to asset price inflation, which in fact was part of the purpose of the whole exercise to begin with by pushing up asset prices that created a wealth effect that made the Americans have more wealth essentially that they could tap into and spend and consume and boost the economy. Looking ahead, all of this money creation, well, we may find that it doesn't create inflation at the consumer price level, but it may end up creating an, another big wave of asset price inflation. And we've already seen this with the stock market and the stock market crashed. But as soon as the Fed jumped in with this announcement, now known as QE Infinity, where they said they would buy as much government debt as necessary, create as much money as necessary to get us through this crisis, the stock market bottomed on that day and skyrocketed afterwards. And Nasdaq's now at a new all-time record high. And s and is not far below. So we've already seen a lot of the asset price inflation. And you know who knows how much more we're going to get. Much of that will depend on how much more money the government, the Fed creates going forward, I suppose. And just as importantly, how long the coronavirus lasts. If we get another huge second wave, all bets are off in terms of what will happen to the stock market. So there are many factors. It's not at all certain that we're going to see a much higher asset prices but you certainly can't rule out that possibility given how much money the Fed has already created and how much more it's likely to create over the next year. Like you mentioned, in a recession, we often have deflation first, and that's because spending has been stifled. It feels like almost no one is spending. So yeah, it does seem to me that inflation would not be a big concern then as long as we're in a recession because we're in a relatively low demand environment. And it's just hard to generate much inflation when demand is low. I mean, the most chronic example of that was a few months ago when the oil price went negative for a little while and the oil price is still suppressed. It's still pretty low. Maybe we'll have inflation in later years, but it doesn't seem very likely in this low demand environment. Now, even during the economic expansion that we had, the longest in history, more than 10 years, the Fed had a hard time hitting its 2% inflation target. It was hitting about 1.5% or so. Low employment like we have now is something that's deflationary, of course. You don't have to pay a worker, for example, more money in order to entice them away from their current job and come work for you like you would have to do if the employment rate were high. At the consumer level, you know, we talk about inflation on both the consumer level and the asset price level, like you mentioned. On the consumer level, consumers feel like deflation is good. And to them, it is good in the short term if the price of a gallon of laundry detergent, for example, Richard, drops from $7 down to six fifty. The consumer sees that as a good thing in the short term. But of course, as we know, there are deleterious effects to deflation, and the Fed knows that. For example, with deflation, with that grocery shopper and the laundry detergent example, if they think the price of something is falling, then they're incentivized to postpone their purchase, and consumer purchases are 70% of US GDP. So we're talking about inflation of assets versus inflation of consumer prices. 
I've got a question for you, Richard. We talk about consumer price inflation or deflation. We're talking about things like buying laundry detergent or buying beef jerky versus asset inflation. And with asset inflation, we're talking about things like real estate and stocks and gold. This is my question to you. Is it possible that consumer price deflation like we're talking about with the laundry detergent, can cause asset inflation because deflation means consumers have leftover dollars to go invest in things like real estate and stocks and gold and therefore pumping those asset prices up higher. So that's my question. Is it possible that consumer price deflation can actually cause asset inflation? Yes, that's an interesting question. I think the answer is yes, because if there is deflation, that means the Fed will cut interest rates to zero, which, of course, is where they are at the moment. Yeah. But take other measures as well, like even more quantitative easing to try to push the consumer price level back to the 2% target, which is the target they try to reach. So, yes, the lower interest rates are and the more money the Fed creates, the more likely it is that asset prices will inflate. Now, of course, it's not necessarily entirely good that asset prices keep inflating because it does lead to greater income inequality, right. which is already at an extreme level in the United States. It could be dealt with through higher taxes, for instance. If, if our society decided that we didn't want to have such a high level of income inequality, there could be a, a billionaire tax or you know, anyone making above $100 million a year could be required to pay significantly higher taxes. But that's something for that Congress would have to pass. And that is of secondary concern right at the moment because income inequality, while it's not desirable in a democracy, is far, far less than having the entire economy collapse with massive unemployment and what would amount to hunger, if not starvation, across the country. So we think about income inequality, we're basically talking about a separation between the haves and the have-nots. If asset prices do continue to become inflated, we want to think about how we can then at least be on the right side of that and be in the class of the haves rather than the have-nots. When we talk about inflation in real estate investing, in general, real estate investors want inflation. As a real estate investor, I think of inflation as the rate at which your mortgage debt's principal balance is being debased while it simultaneously pumps up your asset value. It can also help pump up your cash flow as well. But yeah, it's just such an interesting tug of war, Richard. I mean, just because I want inflation doesn't mean it's going to happen. And I think about this entire deflation versus inflation dynamic as a tug of war. Pulling on the left side of the rope are the deflationary forces of technology and globalization, and then pulling on the right side of the rope is the inflationary force of all this currency printing that we're talking about. But do we see on the left side of the rope where globalization is tugging us down toward deflation? Do we see that weakening as globalization might lead to more nationalization, leading us away from globalization due to the pandemic? Yes, that is a real threat. Globalization now is going to go into reverse to a certain extent. We just don't know how much. In fact, it had already begun to go into reverse before the coronavirus crisis began. With the President tariffs Trump, and the trade war. That's right. President Trump had imposed significant tariffs on China. And even disregarding the coronavirus, it looked like things were going to continue to deteriorate in the relations between the US and China. And now with the coronavirus, Americans realize that we need to bring many of the factories back on shore to ensure that we can produce the materials that we need when we need them. In this case, face masks and ventilators. But in the next case, heaven forbid, if there were actually a real war, would the United States be able to produce the things that it needs to fight the war? So I hope our government will take a very close look at that, and surely they will, and that society will accept that. But on the other hand, it's unlikely that globalization is going to be reversed entirely. Even if there is a trade war with China that gets worse, the world's much bigger than just China. There's still many countries around the world with very low cost labor, more than enough to supply the manufactured goods that are currently being made for the United States in China. This is the big question. To what extent will globalization survive? If the answer is it survives entirely intact, then there probably won't be any inflation at the consumer price level. On the other extreme, if, if it breaks down altogether, 
it is almost entirely certain that there will be high rates of inflation again, as there was back in the 1970s. So where along that spectrum between no breakdown to total collapse of globalization, where we end up on that spectrum is going to be the most important factor in determining whether we actually get consumer price inflation in the United States or not. And my bet is that we're going to maybe globalization will reverse by 10%, but probably not by 30%. So I think the deflationary pressures from globalization are likely to persist unless we see some new and unexpected developments, which of course we frequently do. When free trade is stifled, that puts upward pressure on prices. It almost has to. And it's interesting that you quantify the extent of deglobalization, which could be possible there. Interest rates and inflation are positively correlated. When inflation's high, interest rates are generally high. When inflation's low, interest rates are generally low. Tell us why that's true. That's true because if the inflation rate is 10%, no one is going to lend you money for 5% because they would effectively be losing 5% a year on the money that they lent to you. That's the reason. You gave us that explanation previously on another episode, but you have such a great, concise explanation for why that is true. So from a real estate perspective, when inflation is high, that's generally good for an investor, but mortgage rates are also high, which is generally bad for a real estate investor. And then when inflation is low, that is not good for a real estate investor, but correlating to that, the low interest rates are good for a real estate investor. But of course, in the United States, with these 30-year fixed interest rate loans like you can get almost nowhere else in the world, we can play both sides of this because when interest rates go up high again, we can just stay locked at our low long-term fixed interest rate debt. And then when interest rates are high and we're paying that low rate, that correlates with high inflation, which inflates our asset prices and debases our debt. So when we're savvy and we educate ourselves about this and we can help forecast when inflation might come along, we can really be the beneficiary when we understand that interplay. Richard, with your newsletter, tell us about the extent to which you might be able to help a user forecast the coming inflation. My newsletter is called Macro Watch. It is a video newsletter. So every two weeks, I upload a new video of me essentially making a PowerPoint presentation, discussing something important happening in the global economy. Most recently, it's been very focused on the coronavirus crisis and how the government has been responding to that. But in normal times, it addresses a wide variety of issues. And it explains these issues very clearly. I use a lot of charts, explain them very simply. When someone subscribes to MacroWatch, they will receive one new video every couple of weeks, but they will also have immediate access to all of the MacroWatch archives, in which there are currently well more than 50 hours of MacroWatch videos uh, covering vast, a wide variety of different macroeconomic topics and how they affect asset prices, stocks, currencies, commodities, property, bonds and all the other asset classes that investors are interested in. And also subscribers have access in those archives to four courses. There's one course called How the Economy Really Works, one course called Capitalism in Crisis, another a course explaining monetary policy, which is the most powerful government tool now for managing the economy, yeah. and another course on China's economic crisis. So I hope your listeners will go to my website, richardduncaneconomics.com, and take a look. And if they would like to subscribe, they should hit the subscribe button. And when prompted, put in the discount coupon code GRE, like Get Rich Education, and they can subscribe at a 50% discount. And at the very least, they can check out the other resources on my website and sign up for my free blog. That is a generous thing to do for our listeners, Richard. We're talking about getting information from a classically trained economist that's had experience working with both the World Bank and the IMF, something that you might think costs thousands of dollars a year to get access to. And he really brings it down to the everyday level, but the cost of it isn't nearly that much. And then at richardduncaneconomics.com, when you hit the subscribe button, if you're interested, enter the discount code GRE and you will get half off that price yet. 
Thanks so much for doing that, Richard. It's been great having you here back on the show. Thanks, Keith. It's always nice talking with you. Yeah, well, to summarize a few things, the Fed is going to keep doing what they must to keep us out of a pandemic-induced depression and rather try to make the bottom of the dip a milder recession. Currency creation looks reckless, yes, but it would probably be more reckless if society didn't even have access to clean water because everyone is homeless. I do think of inflation versus deflation as this metaphoric tug of war, like I brought up inside the interview, where the left side of the rope, which is deflationary, has these tugs of technology and globalization, and the right side of the rope, which is inflationary, has currency creation. Will we get high rates of inflation in a few years from all the currency creation? I don't know. No one knows. So what's the bottom line? It's as a real estate investor, if you don't get consumer price inflation, well, you might get the asset price inflation that you want. Even if you get neither, you are invested in something with up to five profit centers, real estate, which as any Get Rich Education listener can tell you are appreciation, cash flow, tenant paid loan amortization, tax benefits, and inflation profiting. Now, you think about how much you learn when you listen to Richard Duncan. Well, imagine what you can learn when you both listen and watch Richard. That's what he offers with MacroWatch, which you can find at richardduncaneconomics.com. If it interests you, you can hit subscribe over there and then enter the discount code GRE for a 50% discount. Thanks to Richard Duncan for helping us go macro today. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, episode 301. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.